I'm Nikki Jobakik from Look Up Strata, and I'm also Managing Director of Tower Body Corporate, a body corporate management company on the Gold Coast. We're very happy to welcome Chris Irons from Strata Soul for this national webinar. We're discussing dealing with challenging people in Strata. Chris will be talking with us to illustrate the different ways of approaching challenging people and how you can ease the pressure and hopefully reach constructive outcomes. This will be followed by some discussion and Q&As. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in today's session, including discussions that arise from submitted questions and also chat conversations that happen, it's not legal advice and you should not be and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in today's session. We're always delighted to have Chris Irons join us for a webinar session. Uh, Chris has presented on quite a few of our sessions over the years. We examined smoking in strata. We've talked about the legalities of CCTV in body corporate buildings. And we've looked at the pros and cons of self-managed strata, plus a few others as well. Um, and I couldn't think of a better presenter for today's webinar. I'm so happy to welcome Chris Irons from Strata Solve. With an unparalleled perspective on strata issues, Chris Irons is a thought leader for the strata sector. For over five years, Chris was Queensland's Commissioner for Body Corporate and Community Management, which is the only role of its type in the world. Now, as Director of Strata Solve, Chris is an independent strata consultant, helping clients to untangle their strata issues with tailored practical solutions. In November 2022, Chris was elected President of Strata Community Association Queensland, which is Queensland's peak strata body. SCA Queensland works closely with government, members of parliament and other stakeholder groups to further the interest of its members. Chris brings to the table over two decades of public sector leadership and policy development. He's a nationally accredited mediator and a strong advocate for trying to resolve strata disputes without the need for legal proceedings. Chris is also a frequent media and content contributor on strata issues. Chris regularly assists our readers with answers to their tricky strata questions here at Look Up Strata. He appears in our newsletters and monthly, bi-monthly editions of the Strata magazine and has authored or co-authored over 100 articles on the Lookup Strata blog mm. um, and, and through his contributions to Q&As on the Lookup Strata site, Chris assists thousands of lot owners and strata managers from around Australia every month and we thank Chris for his ongoing support and assistance to the Lookup Strata community and we welcome you back again today, Chris. Oh, thank you, Nikki. Um, hello, everybody uh, watching either live or watching as a recording. Um, I think I speak for Nikki on this point that we know that there are a lot of places and opportunities to get strata information and strata education. So the fact that you're choosing this one uh, in whichever form that you're choosing to consume it, we're very grateful that you take the time and effort to do all of that. Kick into the presentation proper in a minute. Um, I guess um, this is a, an interesting one in the sense it's not a walk in the park, uh, this topic, uh, and not an easy one to engage with for a whole bunch of reasons. As Nikki alluded to there in the intro, um, I've had a, a few different experiences in Strata. In addition to all of those, I will note uh, I actually live in a strata scheme uh, as an occupier or tenant, if you like. I'm also, as of last week, the chair of my body corporate for an investment property uh, that I own. So I'm seeing things from a whole bunch of perspectives. And uh, to be really blunt with everybody, there is very little I have not seen or encountered uh, in strata. I've met lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds, doing lots of different things and experiencing lots of different things in strata. The end result of all of that is coming to an idea, a few ideas, if you like, about how things work in strata, how things don't work in strata, and how people within those uh, frameworks operate as well. I dare say there are going to be quite a few people uh, watching this uh, with a relatively cynical mindset today, uh, or whenever you're watching this. What would he know? Um, what can he possibly do to help? Um, I've tried everything. We've tried everything. There is nothing that can be done about our particular strata person or our particular 
challenging situation. To which my response is, well, no, literally you haven't tried everything. Literally you haven't. Um, in Strata, the, the weird thing about Strata uh, and, uh, is this. Strata is complex, it's complicated, it's technical, it's emotional, all of those things. And yet, every Strata problem has a solution. I've yet to encounter a Strata problem that does not have a solution. The issue is whether you have the will, the perseverance, and the fortitude to take it on. There's one thing I know for sure about Strata, it doesn't matter which state or territory we're talking about. Unless somebody takes a deep breath and decides to do something, the situation will not change. That's the reality here. So um, there's always a Strata solution. You need to have the resilience because it takes time, it takes effort, and in a lot of cases, it takes a whole lot of money as well. <laughs> I'm going to touch upon some of those matters today in this seminar. I always get very nervous at the share screen moment, Nikki, um, but I'm going to do it. Uh, bear with me, everybody. Excellent. Yes. Outstanding. Let us commence. As anybody who has either met me uh, or knows me, I'm a bit of a word nerd. Words are everything to me, whether it's in life or in strata. Words in Strata uh, have a particular uh, meaning for me. Here's a few words that you may have encountered or even said or thought in relation to Strata. Our old favourite, nuisance. Nutter is always a good one. Test, you can probably see where this is going, I suspect. Moron. Difficult. Arranged. Um, why have I put those up here? Because all of those words are, I dare say, have been used uh, in multitude of strata contexts in, for a multitude of situations for a multitude of people. I dare say a lot of people watching this have either thought or used those terms or maybe have even heard them used about them at different times as well. The problem with all of those words to a greater or lesser extent is that they are all pejorative. They all are designed to provoke strong negative emotional reactions in the person who is on the subject, who is the receiving end of it. Even the word nuisance, which is used in Queensland's strata legislation, and I think it's used in a lot of other strata legislation, uh, a lot of other states and territories as well. Even nuisance is not a word I'm a fan of in a strata context. Why? Because all of these phrases tend to go towards labelling someone. So if Joan in Unit 1 uh, caused a scene at your last AGM and you came out of that thinking, my goodness, that Joan in Unit 1, she's deranged. That's probably all you are ever going to think. Deranged Joan from Unit 1. So when deranged Joan from Unit 1 has some pretty bad water ingress when there's a big rain event in a few months' time and sends a very long, very emotional, very distressed email to get some assistance on it, what's going to happen? You're going to look at that and think, oh, that's just deranged Joan going off yet again. She's deranged. The email might be over the top. There might be a lot of big words and bold and underlined and exclamation points, but she's got a point. She's got an issue, but because you've thought of her as deranged, maybe you're not open to thinking about that. And that's a lot of what this discussion is all about. The idea of moving away from labels, moving away from putting people into boxes, and thinking about the situation a bit more broadly. And it's why I deliberately use the word challenge and challenging, uh, because a challenge can be a positive, constructive thing. You can engage with a challenge, you can do a challenge, you can achieve something out of a challenge and have a positive learning from a challenge. And that is why I deliberately use that phrase. Let's keep going. What am I going to be talking about today? I'm going to be talking about what I think makes somebody in Strata challenging based upon my experience. I'm going to explore the issue of some follies. And I'll get to that in a minute. I have a case study, which I'm sure a lot of you have either heard or will be interested in. 
I'm going to talk about what I consider to be a slightly different approach to things being challenging. I'm going to give you my best practice and then uh, we'll have some questions as well. All right. What makes somebody in Strata challenging then? Here are some things to consider. First up, uh, that's, uh, as I said before, I love words and that's a really good phrase, information asymmetry. What it really means is power imbalance. So uh, information asymmetry basically means in a given situation, one party has a greater degree of knowledge and understanding than the other, and then that gives them more power. In Strata, it's a big issue because Strata is so difficult to understand and engage with for a lot of people. So in a Strata situation, if you have one person with some very good knowledge and understanding of Strata, and then you have another person who has very little understanding, that immediately creates an imbalance. And that imbalance can cause somebody to act out very rapidly uh, and very strongly. Cultural barriers are a huge issue in Strata. When I was commissioner, we would from time to time have to engage translators to assist clients. And I'm sure a lot of you do that as well. It became quite evident after a period of time that there were some languages that simply did not have a translation for certain strata words and phrases. And so if you think about it, if English is not already your first language and then you're being asked to engage in a completely separate second language for which your original language has no meaning and no interpretation, it's virtually impossible to engage. And again, that can then lead to challenging circumstances. Uh, medical conditions, I think this one largely speaks for itself. I'm talking here about both physical and psychological medical conditions coming to play on making somebody or a situation challenging. And closely related to that are uh, external or personal circumstances. Somebody's lost their job. Uh, somebody's had a relationship bust up. Somebody's got some stresses in their family. All of those things are happening in somebody's life, and yet they're also meant to be engaging with strata obligations and responsibilities. Makes it very difficult for somebody to maintain a rational balance about what they're meant to do. But one of the biggest things which makes somebody in strata challenging, based on my experience, is what's happened in the past. In, I think, about 90 maybe even more percent of instances of clients that I deal with, the issue that they approach me about is rarely what the issue is. And it has its origins in what has happened 18 months, two years, or even longer ago. So a good example of that is a couple of years ago, a person in Strata sought approval for something, it got knocked back, and maybe it got knocked back for pretty lame reasons or no reasons at all. The resentment that came from that situation has then built up over time and come to bear on the current situation. I'm not telling you that you need to make excuses for all of these factors, although there's some of them I think you probably do need to. What you do need to do, though, is be aware. Uh, and what I really am talking about here is asking the question, why? Why is somebody the way they are. Why is Joan a bit deranged in your view at that AGM? What's really going on behind the scenes there? You don't have to make excuses. You don't have to excuse behavior. You certainly don't have to excuse abuse. But if you understand a little about what makes somebody challenging, it might make it slightly easier for you to manage the challenge. Pretty much every client that I deal with in my firm I go through this with them and try and do some kind of analysis of the personality to understand where they're coming from. Let's talk a bit about follies. Uh, this is a dictionary definition of what a folly is, and you can read that for yourself. But basically, we're talking about doing something stupid. I think there are several follies in Strata in relation to challenging people and situations. The first one is the general concept that legislation attempts to legislate for these situations. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, the extract that's on screen now is the section from Queensland's Body Corporate and Community Management Act about nuisance and hazard. And you can read that for yourself. Um, a lot of people, when they've got a 
challenging strata situation and, or person immediately leap to this section under Queensland legislation and go, oh, fantastic, nuisance. That's what this is. I'm going to run with that because it's a nuisance. It's a nuisance. Well, the problem with that is, first of all, the nuisance there is qualified, has to be in relation to the use of a lot or common property. That makes it very difficult to say that sending a lot of emails is a nuisance because who knows where those emails are coming from. But what I find really problematic here is that um, our legislators are attempting to apply a legislative fix to what is a social human issue. And you can think about it this way. Uh, that Act is 25 years old. Perhaps when it was first drafted, the legislators had the best of intentions about what they were attempting to achieve. Life has seriously moved on over the last two decades in Strata. It's a real folly looking for legislation to deal with challenging people. The next folly, and apologies to any legal practitioners watching, I respect all of you for what you do. It's a tough job. But I think in the majority of situations, legal proceedings to address a challenging person doesn't really work. It doesn't lend itself to the situation. Even if you were to pursue a nuisance proceeding as per those provisions I just had up there on screen, all it does is address the specific set of circumstances. It doesn't change the behaviour and it doesn't change the person. All you've gone through then is 12 months to get a declaration, but you still end up with relatively the same set of circumstances. And as I said before, it's the folly of labelling people. And why? Because people, believe it or not, they can change. And some of you watching this will go, no way, that will never happen. It does. I've seen it happen. But also labels limit option. The instant you label a situation or a person, you are limiting the options open to you because that's all you will ever think of. So we get to our case study. And my favourites, Paddy and Selma, uh, and everybody's favourite strata problem, smoking. So I'm going to very briefly delve into a very high profile case from Queensland uh, from relatively recently. Um, a lot of people have been interested in this case because of the smoking aspect of it, and that's fair enough. But there's another aspect to it that I think is as important, if not more so, about the smoking. So uh, for those of you who want to read it in full, that's the case reference. Artik is the name of the building on the Gold Coast um, from 2021, although it did not get published until early 2022. I know this because I spent the day speaking to media about it when it eventually got published. What we have here is a dispute largely between two owners in relation to smoking. And we have a high rise building where a person smoking on their balcony, I think it was the eighth or the ninth story, I can't quite recall, the smoke drifting upwards into the lot of the person immediately above. There was an incredibly long history of dispute here. I'm not talking about a couple of nights smoking on the balcony and then a complaint. I'm talking years of the smoke drifting upwards, causing problems for the person above, um, the problems being raised with the committee in different ways, asking for assistance. So we're talking about a very long time and a very lengthy history of dispute. This case was significant because the adjudicator in Queensland, adjudicators can make legally binding decisions about strata disputes. The adjudicator for the first time ever made a declaration about what constitutes a hazard under strata legislation and declared that secondhand smoke was a hazard. That's significant and important. However, the second component to the adjudicator's decision, and here is an extract from that decision. I believe this is either the final or penultimate paragraph of their reasons for decision. I do not consider that it, it in this case meaning the committee, could fail to act simply because it thought it was not its responsibility to decide if the bylaw had been breached or, and here's the critical bit for me, that it was just a matter between residents. So what had effectively happened here is that 
after a certain point in time, this issue started to feel so difficult for the committee that they ended up effectively saying to the parties, this is between the two of you and it's got nothing to do with us any longer. That's a big mistake in my view. The adjudicator concurs with that thinking. Why? Because we're talking about a, a community. It's a high rise building where you've got two people in conflict for a particular reason. But the second reason is because we're talking about smoke. Smoke by its very nature drifts, so therefore by its very nature, it's a building wide issue. What's the learning out of this and what's the relevance for challenging people? Well, here's what I think. Had there been a bit of earlier intervention here, had there been a bit of fulsome consideration of the substance of the issue, and importantly, had labelling been avoided, there might have been also an avoidance of a very major, very public, very unresolved drama. I say it's unresolved because I spoke to the successful, quote unquote, applicant in this case, some months later, they reported to me that the smoking was far from stopping had actually gotten worse ever since the order was made. What do I mean by avoiding labelling? The labels that were effectively used here twofold. The person below was called a chain smoker. And the second label, it's between two owners. On the first, um, some of you might be thinking, well, but chain smoker is a chain smoker is a chain smoker. Sure, except that they remain a person. They remain an owner. They remain a human being. By calling them and referring to them as a chain smoker, we take that aspect out of the equation and we're dealing with a chain smoker. Chain smoker has a very pejorative meaning for a lot of people. So that was the issue, one of the issues as far as I'm concerned. The second one, it's between two owners. Again, we've labelled the situation. It's between those two. It's not for us to do anything with. It actually was something for you to do with. But because a label was applied to the situation about being between two owners, that's where it stayed. So what is this different approach that I am talking about? It comprises of a few aspects. The first one is profiling. And this refers to what I said earlier about trying to understand what it is that you're dealing with when you're talking about a challenging person or a challenging situation. The questions that you might ask is, or the questions, or some of the things that I talk about with clients. Tell me a bit about Joan. What does Joan do? Is Joan working? Is Joan retired? Does Joan live on her own? Tell me a bit more about the person. What you're attempting to do is develop a profile because once, once you develop a profile, that enables you to be able to engage with that situation and with that person on its own terms. The second part of the different approach, if you'd like, and unsurprisingly, it's all about communications, all about words, frequency, tone, and type. I am a big, big fan of not giving people what they want. That makes me a Grinch. What I mean by that is that in many cases, a challenging person relishes the fight. It gives them an audience, it gives them a forum, it gives them attention, but what it does mainly in their mind, it legitimizes their complaint. So when you engage back in the same style, in the same tone and argue the point, they love it. It just fuels their fire. So don't give them what they want. At most, acknowledge receipt of the email. Do you actually have to reply to it all? You'd be surprised by the number of times in Strata you don't have to reply to anything or you don't have to do anything. Facilitated discussions. And by this, I, I, I know that in some Strata situations, there's an eagerness or a willingness to have a discussion to try and sort out the situation, which is fantastic. That's great. You don't go into those discussions with it being uh, unstructured. You need an agenda. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to know the objectives. You also, I think, need some talking points. Uh, it's stuff that I do in my business day in, day out. It's precisely that. 
Here are your talking points to take to your meeting. Here's the speech I think you should give at the meeting. If you are asked a question, here's how I think you should operate, or here's how I think you should respond. If that all sounds very political to you, that's no surprise because I think politics and strata are just about identical. You don't see a politician on TV, you shouldn't see them on TV going on a rambling 30 minute discussion. No, it's short, sharp points. They're given those points to provide for the situation. The same thing here. So if you're going to have a discussion to with a challenging person or about a challenging situation, it's got to be structured. It's got to be facilitated. You might bring in a third person to do that. Someone like myself, someone like your strata manager, if they're engaged to do that, lawyer, whomever. Bringing in that third party assurance immediately diffuses the situation. And in a lot of cases, a challenging person will immediately change how they act if somebody they don't know is there in front of them. We'll keep going. Lobbying, I've alluded to this already. So it, a lot of the times in Strata, lobbying, which is, as the word suggests, uh, lobbying for the outcomes that you want can actually be a really effective way of dealing with a challenging person and a challenging situation. Think about it this way. If somebody is causing problems in the Strata scheme, it might just be the one person, but the, the effect of their challenging behaviour over a period of time is that they bring more and more people to round to their way of thinking. That then in turn leads to an increasing number of people wanting to be aligned with that person. And then when it comes time to vote at a strata meeting, they are then inclined to vote the way that person wants, whether it's pro or against. And so what you then have is a situation where the challenging person has actually achieved their negative outcome in the scheme. Lobbying seeks to address that. So if somebody, if a challenging person is out there sending messages that are causing difficulties, lobbying can combat those messages. Equally, lobbying can also have the net effect of isolating the impact of the challenging person. The more isolated somebody becomes in their views in a strata scheme, the less likely it is they're going to influence others, the more likely it is in turn that the outcomes that everybody wants will carry the day. Then there is the formally kind of structured mediation process. As Nikki said at the start, I'm an accredited mediator. Mediation works Australia-wide because it largely follows the same process. It's not a yak fest that goes for hours and hours and hours. It is a highly structured, highly sophisticated process that leads people through the past and then takes them to the future. Where do you want to be? Mediation can also result in a written agreement, which can also sometimes be converted into something that's relatively legally binding that the parties can live with thereafter. It also is significantly less costly and less time consuming than the equivalent legal proceeding. Speaking of proceedings, and lest anybody think that I am bashing strata lawyers, many, I know many strata lawyers and they're great, most of them anyway. Um, but look, there is a place for legal proceedings in strata. Let's be clear about this. There is a place for them. But in my view, and my view only, they're only really worthwhile if everything else has been exhausted. There are some very limited circumstances where you go straight to legal proceedings, usually though, when all else is exhausted. And there's a pretty strong resolve to see it through. And there's resilience to see it through. Uh, and by that, I mean some resilience about the amount of time and the amount of money and the stress it's going to involve. And that the expectations are set accordingly. Make sure the eyes are wide open. All right, so what's my best practice then? The first one, pause, reflect, regather. If the challenging situation's been going for a while and usually it has, it's probably taken a toll on you, whether you're the individual or the committee, you've got to stop. You've got to pause, you've got to reflect and then regather. Okay, stop, we're gonna draw a line here, take a deep breath, where are we actually at? Then, 
Always remember, has the challenging person actually got a point? They might send you 100 emails a week. 99 of them are rubbish. The 100th one, though, has a legitimate strata issue that they have a right to have heard and addressed. Always remember that. Number three, um, fairly straightforward, get rid of ambiguity. Uh, start getting a bit more precise. Uh, if your standard response to somebody is two pages, think about making it two sentences. Think about whether you actually need to email at all. If you need help doing that, get help doing that. When I was commissioner, uh, I had one of my managers come and review drafts of emails that I was about to send to somebody. Uh, and I used to say to them, does this sound okay to you? Usually they would say to me, Chris, you're not going hard enough. But anyway, that's a separate story. Uh, number four, seek qualified advice. There's no substitute for qualified advice in Strata. If you are doing things and making decisions in Strata without having a rational objective basis for doing so, you're running a huge risk. doesn't matter if you're an individual or a committee. Um, and then finally, and probably the most important, you've got to make a decision at some point. You can go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth literally for years. I have seen that happen. Um, but at some point, you've got to decide and then you've got to live with it and then you've got to implement it as well. So make a decision, put it into place. Part of implementing it means communicating it and being transparent about how you arrived at the decision then be prepared to stand behind it. And part of standing behind it means being prepared to be flexible upon it if some new information comes to light, which means that you might have to revisit your decision. There's no shame in revisiting your decision if you need to. That is it for my presentation proper. Um, should I stop sharing screen? Oh, hang on, no, before I forget couple of contexts. That's me. That's Nikki. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I mean, obviously, we have Chris back so often because he's so good at what he does and he provides some really great information. So I would encourage you if you're seeking help to get in touch with, with Chris. I know he's definitely very busy at the moment, but um, have a conversation with him. Um, wonderful. So we had a question that came in from Rhiannon from Queensland, and she's a strata manager. So she's asking, how do you deal with owners that you know are troublemakers? They have been asked to sit down meetings and the two owners, one of them seems to be taking a personal dislike to the other and is mm. therefore targeting him with issues, such as leaving doors open, telling him he can't bring issues to the committee where both owners are on the committee, um, which are the same issues that other owners have brought or had rectified, scheduling committee meetings on days mm. he knows doesn't suit the other person, hounding him about the tradesman he's using for his own personal internal renovations. The troublemaker holds the, per, the chairperson position and seems to have taken his role in the position as complex cop. Mm. Well, first of all, thanks, Rihanna, and thank you. I uh, hope you're watching. Um, yeah, look, that's not an uncommon situation, unfortunately, uh, and I think I would suspect this is a small scheme that we're talking about. So that's another problem again. My experience is smaller schemes, you find much more of this sort of thing happening. Uh, and that is because there's a higher tendency for owners to be living, uh, but also because you see each other far more frequently in that situation. So let's apply some of what I said in the presentation to this situation. So the first question is why? Why, why do we think this is happening? Why is that person acting in that way? And I'd probably go first of all to things like, what do they do for a living? What sort of job do they have? Not that you can necessarily do anything about that, but it actually add some insight into the situation. So if you look at their job and it's a sort of job that is methodical, process-driven, line by line, forensic in nature, then I think what you can then draw a reasonable conclusion from, that's how they're approaching strata as well. They're putting themselves in this particular situation. So, okay, that's the first thing. And you could actually say to somebody, Listen, I appreciate this is how this is what you do for a living and you're an expert at it. 
that's not strata though that's not how strata operates and sometimes that might actually be a useful thing to do then we keep going after that do they actually have a point here Rhiannon I, I don't know but do they actually have a point it sounds like a few things are actually not going according to plan at this scheme you might say to yourself well they're small things and uh, just let them go okay they are small things to some people but they're not small things to other people and it may well be one small thing that's happening in a strata scheme is actually causing a huge problem for somebody um if we think about something relative that might to a lot of people seem relatively minor leaving the door open it might be for great reasons let the cat out i don't know well and good do we know if whether or not at some point someone just wandered in off the street came in maybe nothing happened i don't know but maybe just maybe something like that happened or maybe in somebody's past somebody did that and it was pretty confronting and pretty challenging for them to deal with then after that i think once you've gone through those kinds of questions you then get down to the nuts and bolts of the situation are they actually exercising their responsibilities appropriately? Because if they're not, then there are things that you can do about that. I would be suggesting, Rianne, and there's an opportunity for a discussion to be held, facilitated, go back to the, it, it doesn't necessarily involve somebody like me, although it can, but it's about structure. What are we trying to address here? If it's just a chash, I don't think that that's useful. But if it's, we've got these specific problems, we need to resolve them, we're not getting through, we're not getting budgets decided, these things aren't being done, these works aren't being done, we need to address them, that's your better option. So I hope that's given a bit of a flavour for what uh, might be possible. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, okay, so uh, Liliana from New South Wales, uh, lot owner, has asked, uh, we are a self-managed strata of four units in New South Wales. For the past 30 plus years, we've had various problems and difficulties with a non-resident owner. They pay their strata quarterly levies and have contributed to some upgrades, but refuse to contribute to special levies for items they do not agree with, um, with, with the work being done. We've sent them several levy reminders, plus a final reminder, which they ignore. On one hand, we're happy that this owner is non-financial and cannot be more involved during meetings. But on <laughs> the other hand, we're struggling financially. Without this owner's share of additional special levies, the other three owners bear the financial burden. So this is probably a bit more of a practical question. <laughs> look, look, it is. I don't think this is about a challenging personal situation at all. This is a situation where someone's not paying. Uh, and in Strata, uh, the bottom line is you need money to survive. If the strata scheme needs money, there's no ifs, buts, or maybes when it comes to strata levies. You, if you are part of a strata scheme, you pay. That's it. No discussions, no black and white. You pay. Uh, and if you don't pay, then you can expect debt collection to be enforced against you. Why? Because without your contribution, the body corporate cannot pay its bills. And if it cannot pay its bills, then the scheme falls into disrepair or even worse, it is not insured. And if it's not insured, your liability will be extraordinary. So it's not about asking very nicely to pay. They have to pay. And if they don't pay, you need to refer it to a lawyer. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have one from Sabrina from Queensland. She's a lot owner and she's asking, how do we deal with the secretary of a committee who will not have meetings? When we do have meetings, they abuse and name call if other committee members give their opinion. Um, I'd love to know the reasons for the secretary not calling the meeting because the legislation is pretty clear on the circumstances in which it needs to happen. So first of all, ask yourself that question. Why, why is she not doing it? Uh, and think about it a bit more, actually. Um, maybe, just maybe, um, she's struggling with the demands of that, of that role. Uh, or uh, coming back to my point earlier about information asymmetry, she actually doesn't understand fully what it entails. Some people think they know what the secretary does based upon their experience in an association or a company. It's not the same here. There are similarities, but it's not the same. Maybe she actually doesn't know, or they actually do not know what they're meant to do. So go through that process and see if you, there's any possibility of engaging with them on that basis. The name calling at the meeting, that's a very different set of circumstances. I, the first thing I'd be saying there is that if that's happening, 
you should be making sure that your meetings are being held at a neutral venue. Don't hold it in somebody's apartment. Probably don't even hold it on common property for that matter. Get get it out of strata, put it in a neutral venue. And then if it's, uh, it depends what the name calling is, I suppose. There, there are some quote unquote name calling that might actually require police or legal intervention. But if it's not at that level, they need to be challenged to use that word again. It's about drawing a line. That's not appropriate to say that to me. Here's why it's not appropriate to say that to me. We cannot have a meeting on that basis. Worst case scenario, you go through that process, the meeting isn't being called, or when the meeting is called, you can't get through items, you're a dysfunctional strata scheme, and there's a whole set of actions. Uh, okay, we had one from John from Queensland. He is a lot owner. He's also on the committee and he's asking, um, I thought this was really interesting. I think there's quite a bit going on here. So mm. under Queensland legislation, if a committee member sees a bylaw being breached, such as unreasonable behaviour on common property or common property being abused or damaged, are they legally compelled to take action to stop the behaviour? If so, this is a heavy burden that often falls on volunteer retirees who live on site. What power under Queensland law do officials have to enforce bylaws and correct behaviour? In my experience, breach notices are not worth the paper they're written on. How much can a BC official or manager rely on local authorities to back them up when the perpetrators may not be breaking any state laws? Could the police be compelled to assist? And he provided a few uh, examples. I've just pulled one out saying teenagers running wild and causing damage um, in the pool area and disrupting other swimmers, I think it was. Yeah, uh, John, I think we're talking about two separate issues here. Um, and probably the point I'd make is that not everything which happens in a body corporate is a body corporate issue to address. Uh, I think that's a real, it's like, there's this idea that everything which happens within the boundaries of my complex is up to the committee to address. No, no. There are some things which happen within a body corporate that are not for the committee to address. And if something is a police matter, that's not the committee's to do. Your example of teenagers running wild here. Um, to me, and I've had this question before in different forms. The first thing to do is um, engage with the parents or the guardians. And what is going on here? Um, that's where it needs to go. Then in probably extreme circumstances, you think about things like child safety, if there is a really serious issue or, or police at play there. Coming back to your first issue though, John, about bylaws. Yes, the committee does have a legal responsibility to enforce bylaws. Yes, if there is sufficient evidence of a bylaw being breached, then yes, the committee is meant to be following that through. But let me say this, just because somebody alleges that there's a problem with the bylaw, it doesn't necessarily make it so. If I say that Nikki is causing noise, on the scheme and I want a bylaw enforced against her, that's one thing. But I need to cough up evidence. I need to cough up the, the logbook of all of the times that she's caused me noise. Me simply saying, Nikki's causing a lot of noise, that's not enough. And you are quite within your rights to decline to do that. You've got to separate out the issues there, John. Um, okay, we had one from Linda from New South Wales, a lot owner and committee member. I'm a secretary of an 11 unit strata and we have the ultimate nuisance as an owner. <laughs> this person says they're a former solicitor and uh, they now- uh, Here we go. <laughs> and they now live for taking the OC to NCAT and threatening legal action over micro issues or made up issues. What do we do? Mm, okay, look, it's a challenging one, that one, because if someone is is a continuing uh, legal practitioner, then they've got certain obligations. So I will say that if they are registered as a legal practitioner and you are of the view that what they're doing as a legal practitioner is inappropriate or even downright wrong, then there are forums to pursue that very specific issue through. But even if they're not, let's again, apply the same uh, criteria that I've been applying all the way through. What's driving this? Um, if you're saying to me, she, she raises every single issue. Well, my response is, why are there lots of issues coming up? Is something going wrong at committee level that's leading to this? If you're saying she challenges everything, my response would be, maybe she has to challenge it because it's not right. Um, you need to examine that aspect of things. 
So next time it happens, the next time there's a suggestion or a threat, just step back a little bit from it and say, oh, okay, she, she's threatening to take us to NCAT again. What has happened here? Are we actually right in this situation? Or does she have a point? And I come back to the phrase I've mentioned several times today. Has she actually got a point on this? It's when she doesn't have a point. If you're telling me she's been to NCAT 10 times in the last year and every single one of those got dismissed, no, no case whatsoever, that's a very different scenario and we're approaching vexatious, uh, a vexatious person. But simply because somebody raises an issue doesn't make them vexatious. If they have to raise it 10 times and each time they're right, that doesn't make them vexatious. That makes them a diligent member of the strata. Okay. And if they do come to the conclusion that they are vexatious, Chris, what happens then? What, what's That's fantastic. Up? I knew you were going to ask me that, Nikki. Um, <laughs> I can't speak for other states and territories. I can speak for Queensland. Um, there is no capacity as it currently stands for somebody to be declared vexatious when it comes to body corporate disputes in Queensland. If I have my way, though, Nikki, that will change and will change sooner rather than later. Okay. And I know in Queensland, I know they, one of the probably changes that came in recently mm. uh, back in 2021, I think it was, was it the legislation changes mm. were that the, a lot owner can only submit six motions a year? And was that, that was part of sort of controlling yep. a vexation? A vex, vex, yeah, vex, that, that, it's, a, it's certainly a form of it, Nikki. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are a few other things that go towards it, but at the moment you can have at it as much as you want uh, in the commissioner's office and there are very few consequences for it. So we might just answer one more question. So this one was from Josephine and Josephine says, I am a challenging person. I want the committee to comply with the, uh, the, the Act in New South Wales. I have spent large amounts of my money on legal advice and the committee has spent undisclosed amounts of owner's monies to oppose me. The strata manager is untouchable and cannot be the subject of action at the tribunal. Over $23,000 of additions to common property have been made without special or committee motions and $10,000 was paid annually to the committee members without disclosure and their companies without disclosure of conflict of interest. The strata manager takes the chair without delegation and threatens me with eviction. My emails are returned as blocked. What do you suggest? Um, a strata manager is not a decision maker, Josephine. That's the first thing to understand. Decisions are, 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 and there are some very, very limited circumstances where that's not the case. But in the vast majority of cases, your strata manager is not a decision maker. Uh, the committee is, uh, or owners are at a general meeting. I would be suggesting to you that your focus, based upon the question that Nikki just read out, it sounds to me like your focus is a bit misplaced. You're focusing on probably on the wrong thing. I'm sorry to be blunt about it, but there it is. You need to be focusing on the very specific issue. Strata is about specific matters. If you start to look at things very broadly, you quickly lose sight. I, I have a client that I will be talking to in the coming days who I think has lost sight. I'm going to try and reduce it down. Okay, what, what is it that we're actually talking about here? Is it access to records? Is it a general meeting motion that was not correct? Is it a spending issue? You've got to define your terms because if, once you define your terms, you can move forward. And I come back to the very point I made at the start, Nikki, every strata problem has a solution every single one but unless you define the problem you can't act upon it i'm sorry to be blunt but there it is so chris uh thanks again did you have anything else you'd like to end the no, session again i appreciate everybody making the effort uh whether you're live or later thanks again much appreciated Excellent. wonderful okay thanks so much chris talk soon see you everybody Thanks for joining us for this educational session. If you gain value from the information, please like this video. You can also engage further with Look Up Strata by subscribing to our YouTube channel or by being kept informed about Strata news via our regular newsletters. Our subscribe link is listed in the description box below.